The job of the blender is to combine these elements in such a way as to produce an overall flavor. A wider repertoire of different beverages than ever before. I think one of the most interesting breweries and certainly one of the most interesting origin stories for a brewery in Australia. Single malts, blends, grain whiskies, bourbons and more. If you want their style to be sold around the world, then unfortunately you're going to have to make a compromise. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson. And this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Founded in 2005 by David Walsh, the rather infamous owner of Tasmania's Mona Museum, Moo Brew is a highly respected brewery that has been somewhat uncompromising in its approach. From the outset, David insisted on packaging the Moo Brew beers in rather ornate, expensive bottles. Its early marketing declared the beers were not suitable for bogans. And the company maintained an allegiance to classic beer styles that were otherwise out of fashion in Australia, generally speaking. So I've watched with interest in recent years as a different kind of Moo Brew has emerged. Packaging its beers in cans, releasing an IPA, creating a new label, Brew by Moo Brew, focused on unfussy, easy drinking beers that seem to appeal to all beer drinkers, even Bogans. Lauren Shepard joined Moo Brew as general manager in July 2020, prior to which she worked for the Domain A and Marilla Estate wine brands that are also part of the Mona family. I asked Lauren whether it was a difficult decision to move from wine into beer, and what was the remit she was given when she was offered the role at Moo Brew? It was a 30-second decision for me to make, James. I was super excited about the opportunity when it um, was presented to me. The reason I suspect that it was offered to me was more because I've got a bit of a reputation for being fairly commercially driven. Um, and whilst Moo Brew has, is the longest operating brewery here in Tasmania and certainly has an outstanding reputation for quality and consistency in beers that are outstanding, the, the challenge put to me was we want these beers in more people's hands and we think you're the right person to uh, to grow that sort of distribution network because of my experience in, in those sort of roles before. It'll remain probably the biggest challenge for anyone that works in the Mona group um, and for David is to find the balance between maintaining that reputation of being, I think, one of the most interesting breweries and certainly one of the most interesting origin stories for a brewery in Australia and still being commercially viable. And, and the balance between fun and viability is always a real challenge. And I hope we're getting it right. And, I mean, one of the most significant changes probably in the last 12 months is the launch of Brew by Moo Brew. That was something that I saw when Moo Brew started. A lot of the marketing was around it's not for bogans uh, and all that kind of stuff. And Brew by Moo Brew looks like a beer that's for everyone. Well, I'm glad that that's how it's coming across, James, because that's absolutely the intent behind it. Including bogans, yeah. <laughs> well, David actually likes to introduce me now as the uh, person who has made his favourite bogan beer. So um, <laughs> it's most certainly suitable for everyone, including bogans. Um, yeah, that uh, that that tagline has has hung about. We've we've come a long way since since that. I think. <laughs> um, and I think I think what was perhaps lost um, from the mind of David to the consumer was that it was always intended to be a little bit ironic. Uh, David David considers himself a bit, you know, a bit of a bogan. He was born and raised in Chigwell, which is um, really close to Mona where Mona is now, but it was certainly in the time that he was growing up and, and when I was growing up, I'm I'm from not far from there myself. It was considered a pretty lower socioeconomic kind of area. So it's um, the irony of the not suitable for Bogans was I think a bit lost in the marketing, but in his mind it was it was almost a, a almost a piss take of himself really because he considers himself a fair amount of Bogan in there. Tell me what your thinking was about 
what that range was going to do and what's coming up for that label? So one of the things that as a team, fresh eyes on everything I think is really useful and, and my fresh eyes and, and Jack's fresh eyes to a certain degree on on what we were offering and what we were hoping to achieve for Mo in the in this first sort of three to five years of us being at the helm, um, the really underlying factor was getting our volumes a little bit higher. Um, I think there's a nice purple patch for smaller breweries that is that sort of 900 to a million litres that makes life a little bit easier Um, and we certainly have the facility to cope with that kind of scale and demand. But um, what we noticed as a gap in our offering was that because of the price of our beers, Um, and the style of our beers as well. We have a significant amount of customers that buy buy a four or six pack and not so many customers that buy by the carton. So ultimately what we were trying to achieve was a whole craft beer market that we really tapped into, which was uh, those prepared to veer a little bit away from a more commercial beer offering, um, but not yet prepared to pay craft beer prices by the carton. So the remit that I gave the team was we need need an easier drinking beer, Um, but there were some pretty stringent um, guidelines around the cost of getting that to market so that we could make sure it hit the market at a a reasonable carton price Um, and also that it It served a purpose in terms of if you're going to introduce a new brand to an existing one, we don't we don't want it to cannibalise anything we were already doing. So it had to have a point of difference, and that point of difference for us was um, moving a little bit away from that more. I guess guess if you want to go back to that tagline, that not suitable for bogans. We wanted we wanted the packaging as well as the contents of the can to feel like it was suitable for everyone um and I feel like I feel like we hit it um really well it was really well received um I, I'm sure if you were to talk to our our brewing team there was definitely some reservations about about heading in that direction um but its success has certainly waylaid some of those reservations one of my favorite pieces of feedback from David Walsh actually was he thinks that brew by Moo Brew is one of the more interesting things Moo Brew's done in the last few years because it's everything that people think Moo Brew isn't. <laughs> and I love I was, that. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that it had been successful. I was just noticing when I did an article on it, it was about six months ago now. So it, it has driven quite a lot of sales? Yeah, it certainly has. I mean, one of the underlying business motivations for it was we needed a skew that gave us some economies of scale in our brewery as well. So, you know, it gives us an advantage of doing volumes that justify things like new silos or perhaps looking to a centrifuge system, things that at the moment the volumes we do are are, are really substantial um, but not quite enough to warrant some of those next step savings that will come and impact all of our beers. And I'm very pleased to say that we're in, what is it, July. So first month of the new financial year and now one of our first points of call is purchasing a new silo to um, to advantage some of those economies of scale that Brew has given us just since February, really. So we're really happy. How big would it be out of your total volume now? Um, it's our second highest selling SKU at the moment. Is that going to be a, a range of beers or or is it just about having you know, just that one beer that sits off to the side? It will be a range. I'm not sure how large the range will be and, and a lot of that will be just sort of decided and dictated by, firstly, the success of this one has probably slowed down the need for the next one. Um, we just wanted to make sure one of my pet hates, I guess, is that I want to make sure that we're fulfilling everything that we already did um, and that's not impacted by the introduction of this range. And so we w- I wanted to make sure that we've got enough breathing space to make sure we're delivering our core range and the brew range really successfully before we add an- another player to the mix. Having said that, we do have one 
kind of earmarked and I haven't even haven't even told our greater team this at this stage, but it's likely we might see another brew product hit the market around January, I would suggest. And for people who don't know the backstory, what can you tell them about, you know, the story of how David found the bottle, that unique bottle that he insisted that the beers were going to be packaged in? Like I said, it's definitely one of the, the more unique origin stories. You hear so many people that start breweries because they're passionate home brewers or they're, you know, they're, they're destined for the industry. Our, our brewery started because, well, mostly because David wanted a Tasmanian beer that he liked to drink. Um, for his new museum, and there wasn't one, so he decided he'd build a brewery to make one. But as the, you do, <laughs> as you do, you know, yeah. like a, a billionaire's home brewery, really. Um, but the real inspiration for um, for the for the brewery's branding came from a bottle he spotted while he was drinking overseas. And it's for those of your listeners that haven't seen it, it's. It is very unique. Um, it's it looks like a uh, a shrunken Pinot bottle for the wine drinkers, I guess, um, and it's beautiful. It's a it is a beautiful bottle, but you know, I guess the commercial side of me would probably not have decided that that was the biggest decision around the brewery. But and we do trademark it. And it's patented to us. We've had a few other, even in the twelve months I've been in the job, James. We've had a, I've had a few people contact me and say, oh, "Is there any chance we could uh, buy some of those bottles for a limited release, or, or any chance you'd be happy to share your bottle with us for something special?" And uh, whilst we love collaboration, there's one thing we're particularly protective of, and that is certainly our bottle. And the beers are still available in both formats. How are you handling that? Yeah, they're definitely available in both formats still. Obviously, I am incredibly grateful for the foresight of my predecessors in um, in moving to a canned option when they did, and it certainly got us through COVID in a way that only bottles wouldn't have. Um, but we... Look, I I don't see us ever not having the bottled version available because it is so much a part of our story. Um, it's certainly reduced in demand. It's certainly a, a much less significant portion of our production is put into bottle now because the demand is certainly not nearly as high as it is for our canned product, but um, they'll always be there. And I forget who it was who told me that, you know, being packaged in bottles, it added quite a significant expense from a packaging point of view, but I think probably also from a from a transport point of view as well. Yeah, 100%. The bottles are, um, are beautiful, but they are uh, significantly heavier from a freight point of view than cans. Um, the cost of the bottles themselves, because they can't be made anywhere in Australia, we have to have them imported. Um, so just the cost of before we put any liquid in the bottle, we've we've already had a substantial outlay in, in cost. Um, but I think we're doing a pretty good job of balancing that with sort of efficiencies and upscales elsewhere that allow us the, it is ultimately a luxury to continue um, putting our beer in the bottles, but as long as we can possibly survive doing it, we will. Probably the biggest change to the to the core range in recent years was the um, addition of, of an IPA. David, I think, was not so much a fan of, of IPAs. Is that fair to say? So the story goes, and then the previous head brewer also made it really clear that he wasn't ever going to do one. Um, but in typical in typical mode of fashion, if you follow any of our marketing, we're also not scared to go, well, we made a mistake and we've changed our mind. Um, no, it was, it was apparently never going to be part of our core range. I'm very grateful that someone backpedaled on that because it's my favourite. Um, and it's a, it's a really beautiful classic West Coast IPA um, and also I think probably one of our most striking can designs too. So I'm a huge fan. I'm glad someone changed their mind and wasn't scared to do so. The range, you know, it used to be very much a, a, about classic old world styles, I suppose. I think from memory there was a Hefeweizen and there was, uh, you know, obviously the Beljo, the Belgian Pale Ale. 
and really probably introducing the IPA, I'd assume, was sort of just about maybe making it a little bit more relevant to what consumers are, are enjoying drinking out there at the moment. Yeah, a hundred percent. It was a it was a first step towards, I guess, some of the changes that we've made in the last twelve months as well. Um, we're really we're really proud that our core range um, and that that range, that terminology is so overused, isn't it? I, like I refer to our core range almost as our icons. We won't we won't change those. That it's important that they tr- stay really true to style because that is such an important part of who we are, making really true to style classic beers. And even the IPA, whilst it is a more contemporary step, it is still a really classic um, West Coast IPA. So I think we're still keeping in that, like when we when we say something is part of our core or icon range, we want to make sure that they, they stay really classic. Um but having said that, I, I'm a firm believer that you can do both. And so whilst we have those really classic styles in the last 12 months, I'm sure everyone's noticing that we're also um, prepared to show that we can play in a more agile and contemporary space as well with our limited releases. What's kind of been the ethos behind those? Has Jack got free reign or is it something that you all sit down and and um, kind of brainstorm about the style of beers you want to be bringing out as, as limiteds? Jack's got a fair amount of rain. He's um, he's a very methodical, technical and inventive brewer by nature. Um, so he's really excited about having some opportunity to get some beers that have his signature on them as well out into trade and show what he can do as any new head brewer would be. Um, so it's as much about giving him the opportunity to do that. Um, but there are commercial decisions behind it as well. What I what I have found, and, and I'm sure there'll be other breweries that would agree, is that uh, when you have a, a really sort of smallish core range, the limited releases do a wonderful Oh, for want of a better phrase, James, I guess tap on the shoulder to our customers when the when the new release is out and we've got something exciting and new to talk about. It tends to remind people that maybe they also haven't ordered a pale ale or a pilsner recently, and so we see a lot of customers sort of reminded about the fact that we're still there. Um, and so commercially, the limited releases. Uh, threefold really it gives Jack that kind of opportunity to flex his his sort of innovation muscles um, it reminds people to purchase their regular classic mobru as well as the new one and it keeps us in the news cycle keeps us having something new to talk about one of my favorite bits of advertising that that moo has done was probably about this time last year or maybe a bit earlier was actually with the uh, the billboard, well, pictures of billboards in airports. Was that um, was that something that happened uh, while you were there, or did that predate yourself? It was all around the same time. It was um, interesting time to start a new role, James, right in the middle of I bet yeah. COVID pandemic. Um, but I can't take any credit for that. I our marketing team, who is also Mona's marketing team, is spectacular and I loved I loved that as well it was in the it was in the interim phase really between Dave leaving and me starting um and they took it upon themselves to um you know to in a very moo ironic way um which I think is like an underpinning kind of theme with all of our marketing we can be a little bit self-deprecating we can be a little bit ironic um but we're also really honest um I thought it, yeah, everything that I sort of suggested I would like to see Moobrew doing, it was a, it was the epitome of it. So I was, yeah, I loved it. And our, our database loved it as well. Obviously, it's all you know at Moobrew is uh, the last 12 months. What has been the impact on your business as a result of COVID? Because I would imagine that it would be fairly exposed to the tourism sector. You know, you get a lot of visitors to Tasmania, and that's obviously where a lot of your volume would normally be sold. Yeah, absolutely. It was a really, um, it was a, yeah, it was a, certainly a challenging time to, to take it on. And just to add a little bit of extra stress to our plate, we also 
decided to bring all of our distribution back in-house as of July last year as well. So um, we had been dealing with a distributor selling our beers everywhere else in Australia and we now do everything with our own full-time employees in each state. And So there was a, there were a lot of challenges for sure. Um, but we're also very fortunate that some of the things that make selling Moo Brew in other states really difficult, the fact that everyone um, nationally during lockdown certainly tended to buy local. Um, and so that, yeah, that made it a little bit challenging for us in Sydney and Melbourne, for example, but um, we were very well supported in Tasmania uh, and, a, and a significant amount of our production is sold in Tasmania. And we're very lucky where we are that the lockdown, whilst um, whilst we did everything we could to support our hospitality friends and obviously the tourism sector for us is such a big part of what we do and, and Mona is our is our biggest customer, as you would suggest and understand. Um, we were lucky in that our lockdown period wasn't nearly as extended as it has been for other states. Um, and to be honest, our tourism sector is bouncing back in a way that we none of us could have dared to hope for, really, because Tasmania is seen as, I guess, one of the safer places to visit. So once the museum reopened, you know, it was closed for almost nine months. But once the museum reopened on Boxing Day and there's um, a renewed emphasis from Tourism Tasmania and um, and all of the industry councils that support that network here in Tasmania, we've been really lucky that our impact is nowhere near as, as, as large as I can imagine it has been for other breweries around the country. Have you grown your mainland sales significantly over recent years. It's always struck me that, you know, Moo Brew, considering how well known it probably is to people on the mainland, because we all love to go to Tassie and we all love Mona when we go there, and a lot of people experience Moo Brew when they go to Mona, that the sales of, of Moo Brew beers on the mainland didn't seem to be as big as I thought maybe they could be. Is that something that is slowly changing? We're definitely seeing significant growth in Victoria. Um, we're really well represented in Victoria now and we have a full-time representative there. Sydney is definitely more of a challenge. Um, Everyone says that, though. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's not news to anybody. Um, but we're doing – so it's definitely part of my remit is to, to get the beers more widely distributed. Um, and we have – started down the path to something I think is going to significantly help us in Sydney. I don't know if you've heard about it, James, but it was um, not long ago announced that uh, Moo Brew is uh, collaborating with an investor in Sydney, in, the, in Newtown, to be more specific, on a redevelopment of an old theatre there. So we are, it's going to be the Hub Theatre in Sydney is going to be redeveloped into an urban house of brews at which there will be five separate bars operating all of the time, all with a different state of origin, if you like. And uh, Moo Brew is very excited to be one of the collaborators on that. So once that opens, we will have a permanent home in Newtown where our beers will be on tap always, which is very exciting for us. Yeah, I mean, that's an incredibly exciting project and just up the road from me too, I might add. Um, oh, what, what do you? It did sound, though, when I read about it, that there was a lot of hurdles for that project to get past in order to come to fruition. You know, how confident are you that it'll eventually get there? Oh, I'm very confident now. To be honest, I, um, I would definitely describe myself as, um, as more conservative when it comes to... Uh, business in general, and there was um, we've already overcome most of the significant hurdles. I'm very confident that it's going to go ahead, um, and yeah, genuinely thrilled that our we've got lots of loyal customers in Sydney that buy from our website or that, have, as you say, have been to Mona, and once they get home, they order from us directly because it's the most convenient way to get access to our beers and it's just going to be so refreshing to be able to confidently say to people, not just you might get a beer on tap at this pub, but you'll get every, every beer we make anytime you want it at Urban House. How far off is that likely to be then? 
<laughs> well, COVID probably puts a little bit of a uh, a bit of a question mark over that. Um, I imagine it will be sometime in the in twenty twenty two calendar year. Not, it's really it is that vague at the moment. But um, I would hope it would be. I would hope it would be in the first half of next year. But it's probably more likely the second half of next year. And is there a lot of scope for Mubru to be really able to, you know, create its own space within that space, if you know what I mean, that really kind of represents your brand? Absolutely. We get full creative licence on our bar space. So we'll have a we'll have a 10 tap bar that is um, completely under our our control. So um, it will be exclusively, like it will be Tasmania's representation in that space, but it will be, the bar will be designed by our Mona team. Um, it, all of our intellectual property and logos and things will be used. One of the bigger advantages as far as we were concerned from an industry point of view was that um, whilst we can cope with the scale of demand that hopefully the, the Hub Theatre Project will need in terms of um, in terms of big supply, um, we also have been given full discretion and licence on how those taps are used. So if we want them all to be Moobrew taps, they can be, but we don't foresee that happening. We, we, f- we feel like it'll be a great advantage to the Tasmanian industry as a whole for us to be able to share, you know, a couple of rotating taps with other breweries in Hobart that may not have had the opportunity to take on a project like that on their own. Um, and we're really excited about that. There's so much great beer being produced in Tasmania and having the opportunity to, to sort of share that, that chance around is one of the things that really excited us about the project. All right. Well, Lauren, it's been really great to chat with you and congratulations on everything you're doing there. I think it's uh, really exciting for Moo Brew and look forward to hopefully having a beer with you either down there at the museum or perhaps in Sydney next year. I hope so. I'll look forward to that, James. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.